again. Good morning, church. Good morning. There we go. Good, good. Welcome to what I'm calling session five of Reality Weekend. We've gone through four sessions this weekend as a youth group over at First Baptist Church. I'm so thankful that uh, we have churches in town that work together and uh, put on events and uh, three lives get uh, changed forever. And uh, this morning, I hope you give me grace. I'm up here, eyes are just red, eight hours of sleep total, maybe throughout the weekend. Uh, oh, by the grace of God, I'm going to get through this, and uh, we're going to dive into the Word together. But this weekend was pretty awesome, and uh, we've been uh, studying Genesis 22, and we're going to be there today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and jump there. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap about this weekend, some things that stood out to us this morning, Sunday school class with the students. Oh my goodness, amazing. But we studied Genesis 22 and the students were just leaning in and they were learning. And that's what we're here to do this morning is to lean in and expect God to teach us something. Not Brother Rob, but God's word to teach us something this morning. I hope we can leave this place changed. If you're here this morning and you've been just uh, battling through life on your own and you're ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that you don't leave today until you do that. You, you will have a, res uh, a response time at the end where you can do that. But there's, there's something about this weekend that was so special. It's got me kind of emotional. Is that when you hear the kids say the things that you've been wanting to teach them, and they're like singing them to you. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. We got some pretty mature people sitting right here. You think they're a bunch of knuckleheads? They are really, but, <laughs> but there's some spiritually mature Christian people right here. And there was something we all learned that was so amazing. And, and, and these kids got it. They, they understood it. The speaker said this, is that, the word calling in the Bible, when you see it, it it's, it's more plural than it is singular. It's, you, you were called to several different things, uh, like your job. You, you, you have a, God places a call for your vocation. He does that. He calls you to your family. He does that. But, but there was one thing that he put over all of them. Obviously, God's call to salvation is, is supreme, but there was a calling that he places on our life. And it was a calling. Students, what was it? Say it, say it loud. Church. To church. A calling to church. And he said this, and, and I'm not stepping on toes. If I'm doing any toe stepping, it's God doing it. But he said, students, and, and, and he spoke it boldly. And I was like, man, I, I got to repeat that. So this is stolen. But he said, students, your parents are unintentionally or accidentally teaching you things. And they're teaching you that church is optional. Church isn't a priority. He said, no. Church, God commands it that you are called to a body. And these students this weekend, they understood it. They said, hey, we're not only called just to, just to each other right here in this group, but turn around, students, look at everybody. We're all called to this church. And it's not this building. It's these people that are in this building. We are called to each other. We are called to serve each other. We are called to pour into each other. And there was something that just amazed me. The, uh, the other speaker, I guess, named Ed Newton. He's a pastor in San Antonio. And he's into his message. And he just all of a sudden stops and kind of looks over here. And he says, excuse me, ma'am, what grade are you in? You know, this 6th through 12th grade. And she's like all confused because she's not in a grade. She's 86 years old and sitting third row. Yeah. And she says, I come because I've been a host home leader since 2006. And I'm going to be here with these kids. Isn't that awesome? So, so real quick, just to indulge me in something real, real quick. Because students need to know something. You know, if we're called to this church, they need to know something. There's a lot that goes on. Obviously, I'm a student pastor, and we got Brother Michael. He's our lead pastor. We got Brother Sean. He's our associate pastor for a little while longer. We're so excited for him. And this kind of has something to do with it. 
But if you were a host home leader this weekend, we didn't have a whole bunch of them. If you were a host home leader, I hope I don't make you feel uncomfortable. Would you stand up and hold your applause? Uh, because we're going to get there, some host home leaders. If you were one of our, yeah, the, 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 there's a, there it is. You guys opened up your homes this weekend to some knuckleheads. But thank you, okay? Stay standing. If you were one of the college leaders this weekend, stand up. Yeah, like our worship team, like y'all were in sound booth, yeah. Y'all are like, where's Rob going with all this? Okay? If you're, if you're a, let's, let's just contain it to youth for right now, 6th through 12th grade. If you're one of our Sunday school teachers in uh, our youth, stand up. If you're one of our small group leaders on Wednesday nights, midweek, stand up. Now let's expand it further than just 6th through 12th grade. Let's go church-wide here. If you're a Sunday school teacher, stand up. And, and I'm not going to try to bring shame to anybody because we're going to try to get to everybody, okay? Hold on. Uh, if you're a Sunday school teacher, uh, if you're any kind of midweek leader with uh, K through 5 kids or uh, pre-K uh, children's chapel, they're probably leading over there right now. We're so thankful for them. Stand up. We need to see what this stuff looks like. If you serve in a kitchen on a Wednesday night, stand up. If you, if you serve this church in any capacity, whether it be holding a door on a Sunday morning, stand up. If you have, if you have ever taught Sunday school, I know some of y'all have been here since like Jesus was born. <laughs> but you've been serving. If you've ever poured into somebody, if you've ever been a weekend leader, if you've ever been uh, somehow serving and pouring into others, I want you to stand up. Choir, what, whatever it is. If you sing in the choir, stand up. Brother Clint, I hope this is a long enough intro. I'll get to the slides in a minute. And I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, but we all serve. If you serve in the sound booth, if you serve on stage, whatever. You guys have made, this is the sermon title, have made God's promises possible. He decides, he, he wants to use people to make his word come true. You guys are called to each other. We serve each other. And we get to do it. For God. We get to do it for Him. You guys can have a seat. Thank you for standing up. And, and, and maybe you didn't stand up this morning. Hey, Children's Chapel, we would love to have you. We, we would love to have you. Midweek, we would love to have you. There, there's a lot of things we would love to have. But we're all called to each other, to love each other, to pour into each other. And, and I did all that because students, those people that were all standing up, they came before you. They... They were serving. They were pouring into you. But guess what? Who in the room, by show of hands, has ever had somebody pour into them? Isn't that amazing to think about? I come to know Christ because of somebody else. Amen, right? I want you to all put that person on your heart right now. Who was it that came before you that led you to Jesus Christ? Or maybe even had a part in it. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a, a school teacher. Maybe it was somebody, somebody poured into you so that you know who Jesus Christ is. Somebody did that. And sometimes, I'm going to try to get through this point of the intro, because y'all probably wondering why in the heck does he have that jacket on? It, I don't <laughs> that somebody has come before you to make all this possible. At the very beginning of time, and we're going to get into this about what the word covenant means. It means promise, a, a holy agreement. God doesn't need any of us for this to come true. Look at Genesis 1. God spoke and it happened. Isn't it awesome that we get to serve a God and he chooses to use us to do it? It's amazing. And so today we'll get into Genesis 22 in a moment, but I'm going to share a story with you. Because a lot of times in church, we forget something. We forget this past week was one of those weeks, one of those uh, tough ones. Lost my grandpa 18 years ago. Robert Abbott, where I get my name, gave me this jacket. And it's something important that we need to realize. A lot of times we forget things about God. 
Here's number one. You're an image bearer. And there was something said at his funeral Friday that I was like, man, I'm using that Sunday morning. Let me write that down. My uh, cousin, I guess, he's more like an uncle, a distant uncle. Uh, it's my grandpa's nephew. They were riding around, and in the later years of my grandpa's life, dementia and Alzheimer's struck hard. There were some good days. There were some bad days. There was days that you'd have the same conversation with him five times. And I said, you know what? We're going to have this same conversation. It's okay. I'm going to have it, you know. We're going to rejoice in that because we're having a conversation. Then there was bad days that, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't know who you were. So my uncle, cousin, uh, grandpa's nephew, is driving down a highway one day. Grandpa's in the truck. And he's, um, my, my grandpa, he owned a bunch of land. And he loved pine trees, of all just pine trees. It's weird. I guess it was money. I, I don't know. But, but he just loved property. Like, he just loved to look at trees and make, man, this is beautiful. And my grandpa made a statement to my uncle and said, man, that's some beautiful land right here. That's some beautiful land. Wally turned around and told Robert, my grandpa, and said, Robert, do you know whose land that is? He said, no, I don't know. He said, that land is yours. And sometimes we need to be reminded not who we are, but whose we are. And it's through you guys that we get to do the reminding. So let's get into our text this morning. I made it through without many tears. Genesis 22. We see Abraham. He's here and he's gone through life and God has established a covenant with Abraham. We see it in your outline there. It's uh, Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 2. There's a mistake there at the end. It's just something that you can go to. We don't have to pull it up on the screen. But this is a reminder of the promise that God made with Abraham. He said in uh, Genesis 12, says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And your name will be great and you shall be a blessing. Genesis 15, 5 said that, and he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. He made this promise, this agreement, this covenant that said, hey, I'm going to do something. And, and if you're reading the Old Testament, if, if you're in Genesis, you're going to see covenant a lot of times. It's agreement. It's an agreement with God, our holy creator, with man. God speaks, we must obey. That, that's how it works. And we see this. And in this, he told Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. And you're going to bless the entire world. You're going to do that. So opening up to our text, this morning, Genesis 22 it says, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and I want you to kind of make note of that because we're going to refer back to it in a minute at, towards the end. He said, Abraham, and he said, here I am, here I am. Now real quick, we need to make sure that that word tested isn't confused with tempted. God is not going to tempt us. He's not going to do that. He's not the author of evil. He's not going to do that. He's not going to tempt us. This is a test. And some of us have been tested before. We've been stretched. There's been things happen in our lives and we start to ask questions. Have y'all ever started asking questions about God, why is this happening in my life? It may be a test. It may be a test because God may have something great for you to do. Matter of fact, God's word said that, hey, I'm going to make you a great nation. And if we see in covenant... It is God in action. God is doing the working. We get to just take part in it, but God says it. It's going to come true. We can put our faith and trust in God's word. And here's a little, little another snippet from the weekend. Last night, the speaker said, you can't expect to hear from God with a closed Bible. I was like, man, my students need, whew, wow, get off my toes. But he said that, and here's the test, and it's going to get crazy. Y'all are like, 
And the beautiful thing about Scripture is, is that we get to see things after the fact. Abraham's living in it. We get to see the beauty of this story that we're going to get to. We see that. But Abraham's being tested here. And it says, he said, now take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. God is commanding this. And you're like, man, didn't he just tell him he's going to make him into a great nation? And if you read earlier in the chapters there, that he didn't have a son for this to happen. And God blessed him and uh, God used him. And here is Isaac finally. Here's the guy that's going to make all this possible. And now God is telling me, take him? God, are you crazy? Sometimes we ask ourselves that question if we're honest. God, are you crazy? No, God's not crazy. He's crazy about you, though. And here's what he goes on to say. Because Abraham, he's probably thinking about the covenant, the agreement that God made with him. God, how's this possible? How's this possible? And we need to be more like Abraham in this and trust God. Trust God. And we see how Abraham responds. It's, it, it's an urgent, immediate response there. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. When I said rose early in the morning, I haven't had much sleep. And took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He began his journey. It was urgent. And there was a commitment in this that you're going to see. And it says, On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Now this is the response and the commitment that I was talking about. There has to be commitment in this thing of following what God says to do. It says, On the third day, He's had three days to talk himself out of this. How many times have we talked ourselves out of doing something for God? We'll talk ourselves right out of, we got to stay committed to what God calls us to. And then it goes on because we start to see his faith and his confidence that he has in God who has made all these promises. He says, Abraham said to his young man, this is verse 5, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad, the young boy, or Isaac, will go over there and we will worship and return to you. This is Abraham saying something that we must not miss. A lot of people can say, oh, he was just telling these guys a lie. So they don't like freak out that Abraham's going to go kill Isaac. Because if he told them that, it, you know, they probably would freak out and try to do something, right? Hopefully. Hopefully they were friends with Isaac. I, I don't know. But he says that we're going to return to you. And in this, it shows his confidence that he knew or trusted God. And it goes on because we start to see Isaac in the mix now. It says here, verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Isaac, his son. In the very first part, let's put that first scripture back up. Genesis, or 22.1. Uh, so, sorry, 22.2. The son, your only son, whom you love. This is awesome when you think about it. This is the first time love is mentioned in the Bible here. Whom you love. Doesn't this look like very similar to what you guys know to be the gospel? Isn't this very similar? The son whom you love. And I'm going to ask you now to go and take him and kill him. To offer him up as an offering. So jumping on in our text. It says in verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. And laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And here's where Isaac. He starts like questioning some things here. Like most of us. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said. My father. He said here I am. And he said, behold, we see the, the fire in the wood. We got that. You know, hey, we're prepared here. But he noticed something was missing. He said, but there's no lamb for the burnt offering. Isaac's probably a little bit nervous at this point. What is dad doing? 
Don't we get nervous sometimes when, 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 when we're in the mix of things, that, that, that we're there serving? We start getting nervous. Isaac here, he's nervous. But there was something, even in his nervousness, he placed his trust in his father. He placed his trust in his father. He trusted him. And it says, so the, so the two walked on together. Or Sorry, that's verse 6. Abraham said, verse 8, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Ultimately here, Abraham places his trust, his faith in his heavenly father here. The book of Hebrews, if we can pull that up, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. Let's get that on the screen if we can. And it says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And the one who had received the promises was offering up his only son. It was he to whom it was said, Through Isaac your descendants shall be named. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, for which he also received him back as a type. Abraham is saying here, and it was displayed beautifully last night as we wrapped up our small group discussion. Teenage boy says this. He said, God, may we offer up our lives to you. May we give our Isaac to you. And even if it doesn't come back, may we still worship you. I was like, ooh. I'm still in that. I'm putting that in a sermon. But it was just a beautiful moment that a young person would pray that prayer there. But Abraham, through confidence, through trust, through faith, placed it in his heavenly father, not the circumstances that was surrounding him. And he's going to carry through because he's trusting God. Abraham said, God will provide it says, verse 9, Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Took the knife to slay his son. In this, he's carrying through with God's promises, the, God's word, God's command. He said, I'm, I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you. Here is my son. I'm offering him up to him. As a sacrifice. Because you said it. You commanded it. And he took the knife and he's like right here with it. And we learned this weekend that the sign for Abraham is taking the letter A and doing this right here. As if there's some resistance. We, we, we learned that this weekend. Is that boom. The angel of the Lord it says verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him. From heaven and said, remember I said we was going to refer back to verse 1 about the Abraham. This time it's like, Abraham, Abraham. Hey, whoa. Whoa. Stops him. Abraham responds, here I am. In the midst of all of our life and all of our serving and journey and all that stuff, here's one thing that we can say that should be our motto of life. Here I am. Here I am. Listen to God. Listen to him. And just say, God, here I am. Here I am. What do you want me to do? And here's the beautiful story of the gospel portrayed here in Genesis 20, uh, 22, verse 12. says, he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing for him. For now, I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This morning at the end, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to go ahead and ask it now so you can be thinking about it. What is your Isaac? What is it that you're holding on to that you love so much? What is it? Might be someone, might be something, but what is So, so be thinking about that. But, but we see here in the scripture that Isaac is spared. His life is spared. And here's the thing about it. God took Isaac offering. Abraham gave it to God. But here's something that we sometimes confuse ourselves with. We think that serving God, following God, trusting in God means that we have to always stop doing something. We have to give something up. We have to sell this and do that and just God... 
If you take what God has blessed you with, give it to him and be faithful in that, God is going to take it and return it back to you to use it for his honor and glory. So whether it be your, your, your time, my students were saying it this weekend, uh, their, their Isaac was their time. They don't have much time. Some of you guys in the room are thinking, they have no idea what's coming. Maybe it's our, maybe it's our money, maybe it's our belongings. Whatever your Isaac is, be thinking about that. And God here provides a substitute here. It says, and Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. There was a substitute that day. And when God called Abraham to go climb that mountain, God had already sent the ram. He had already sent the ram, the male sacrifice. He had already sent him. So when we think about trusting in God, trusting in what he says, you're not at the center of the story. You're just over here climbing a mountain. There's other people around working. There's others that came before you that are going to make God's promises possible. There's a lot of things that we do that we get to serve, and then we see the beautiful stories happen of, hey, this person was right here at the right time and all this. All we can sum it up is God did that. That's what we can say. God sent that substitute. I'm going to read an excerpt from, it's basically a summarization of John 129. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this son, Isaac, Abraham's son, was insufficient that he was only human. This excerpt here says, That son, God's son, Jesus, was the all-sufficient being who was 100% human and 100% God. This son's stripes, talking about Isaac, could heal no one. But that son's stripes could heal everyone. This son was incapable of carrying the weight of the sins of the world. That son bore our griefs and sorrows. This son could not look on the myriads of time and see every individual. And even if he could, there would be nothing that he could do. Because of the state of his depravity. That son looked down through the myriads of time and saw that he was infinitely valuable and worth dying for. We have value. God says that we have value. This son was on the mountain alone with just his dad. But that son died on a mountain in front of the whole world while the father had to turn his back. This son needed that son, but that son needed no one. And Abraham could trust God with the impossible because of what the son would one day do. My goodness. And then we see God's promises come a reality. And it says, Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. You guys have probably heard a fancy preacher probably say Yahweh Yara or Jehovah Jireh. That is saying the Lord will provide. We need to say that over our lives today. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. When you think there's no other way, the Lord will provide. And then he says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn. God is so awesome, he can just swear by himself. A lot of us in the room probably swear a lot by God, not in a good way. But if God says, hey, I can swear by myself. I'm the creator of all this. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. Here it is again, that covenant God is acting. God will bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and the sand in which of the seashore. And you shall, and your seed shall possess the great, possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. We cannot obey God's word unless we have God's word open in our lives. So this morning, as we start to go back to that question, what is your Isaac? 
What is it? Now, I just want you to think about it because in a moment, we're going to have a time to respond. We're going to have a time to respond. Students, you're going to be asked to respond as well. Church, you are too. We're all here together, called together. But what is your Isaac? What is it? What is that thing that you love the most? Just to give you a hint, one of my students said baseball is my Isaac. Baseball. He said, I'm going to take baseball and use it for God. But first, we got to give it to him. We got to give it to him. What's keeping you from giving it to God? What's keeping you? You know, in our lives, God's going to call us a bunch of different places. We're so thankful for that. We got Brother Sean over here who was called to this church 22 years ago. Faithfully served for 22 years. That's awesome. God has another calling now for him to go lead a people. We are called here. God knew you were going to be here this morning. And God doesn't want you to leave and still hold on to Isaac. Because a lot of times we think that, hey, if we give it over to God, we can't use it. I said it before, and I told you I was going to bring it back. If we give it to God, God's going to bless us and give it back and say, hey, use it for my honor and my glory. What are you holding on to this morning? What are you holding on to? And I'm going to ask you guys to respond because I think we got a lot of Isaacs in our life. Through COVID, we were taught some things that maybe, hey, Church isn't a priority. Serving God isn't a priority. It's just something I do sometimes. No. God commands it. He says, hey, you're called to these people. And while you're here, you're to love those people. There's going to be disagreements and arguments and all those good things, bad things. But we're called to love each other. How are we going to do that if we're still holding on to what's ours? Give it to God this morning. So I'm going to ask you... I'm going to ask a few of my uh, college leaders to come down. If you were one of the group leaders, I want you to come down and kind of spread around in the front. I want our pastor to come up as well during, during this response time. And wouldn't it be awesome that if a called out people said that, hey, I'm going to give it to God this morning. And God turns around and uses that for you to go out and be the Joannes of the world. To be the small group leaders of the world. To be that person that I told you to put on your heart this morning. To be that person for somebody else. We're all called to that. Don't think right here that God can't use you. Don't think that God can't get, take your life and use it for his honor and glory. All we got to do is give it to him. So this morning, what is your Isaac? And what's holding you back? from offering it up to God this morning. So as we enter into this time of response, if you feel led to come down and pray, and it would be awesome if we just turned this place, and I say it a lot when I'm preaching, to a house of prayer. It'd be awesome that we just had a, if we just fell on our face and said, hey God, take it. It'd be awesome. And imagine what would happen in your families, in your workplaces, if God took what you were holding on to and used it. It'd be awesome. So I'm going to invite you to respond however the Lord leads you to respond. And maybe, maybe this morning you're sitting here, and this is why I invited Pastor up. Maybe you're saying, hey, it's time for me to get in the game. Be a part of this church. I've been coming. I got the platinum guest card. Let's make it real. Let's get in the game. Let's start serving. We're all called somewhere. Why not here? Why not use it now? Why not now? Not, not, not later, now. Let's use it now. For his honor and glory. Students, if you want to respond this morning, your leaders are up here. Church, if you've got some decisions to make, maybe, maybe you've been holding on and not trusting Jesus. And maybe this morning, February 20th, 2022, you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want you to get it right today. Maybe it's, maybe it's time to me, hey, it's time for me to get in the game, join this church, and I need to do it through baptism. Maybe it's that this morning. 
Let's respond how God leads. Let's bow our heads and pray. And as I finish praying, when I say amen, I want you to respond, not for me, but for God. And I want you to give it to him this morning. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word, your promises, Father. Father, we know that you don't have to have us, but you love us anyway. That you sent your only son. That you love the world so much. And Father, this morning, may we give up our Isaac to you, Father. May we give up that thing that we've been holding on to. And Father, I pray that you take it and return it so that we can use it as a body of people to give honor and glory to your name. Father, I pray that you move in this place. If somebody needs to be saved, let it be today. Father, do what only you can do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.